Audiobookie presents Outpost on Io, a short story by Lee Brackett, read by Ian Hale. But first, did you know? Io is one of Jupiter's four largest moons, known as the Galilean moons. It was discovered by the Italian astronomer Galileo Galilei on January the 8th, 1610. Galileo observed Io through a telescope he had constructed, making it one of the first celestial objects discovered using a telescope. Io is unique for its vibrant and dynamic surface. Characterized by intense geological activity, tidal forces generate tremendous heat within Io's interior, resulting in frequent volcanic eruptions that have shaped its colorful and ever-changing landscape. And now, without further ado, our feature presentation. In a crystalline death lay the only release for those prisoners of that Ionian hell outpost. Yet McVickers and the men had to escape, for to remain meant the conquering of the solar system by the inhuman Europeans. Chapter 1 McVickers stopped at the brink of the dark round shaft. It was cold, and he was stark naked except for the silver collar welded around his neck. But it was more than cold that made him shiver and clamp his long, bony jaw. He didn't know what the shaft was for, or where it led. But he had a sudden feeling that once he went down, he was down for good. The small, round metal platform rocked uneasily under his feet. Beyond the railing, as far as McVickers could see to the short curve of Eo's horizon, there was mud, thin, slimy, blue-green mud. The shaft went down under the mud. McVickers looked at it. He licked dry lips, and his grey-green eyes, narrow and hot in his gaunt, dark face, flashed a desperate look at the small flyer from which he had just been taken. It bobbed on the heaving mud, mocking him. The eight-foot European guard standing between it and McVickers made a slow weaving motion with his tentacles. McVickers studied the European with the hating eyes of a wolf in a trap. His smooth black body had a dull sheen of red under the Jupiter light. There was no back nor front to him, no face, only the four long rubbery legs, the roundish body, and the tentacles in a waving crown above. McVickers bared white, uneven teeth, his big bony fists clenched. He took one step toward the European. A tentacle flicked out daintily and touched the silver collar at the Earthman's throat. Raw electric current generated in the European's body struck into him, a shuddering, blinding agony surging down his spine. He stumbled backward, and his foot went off into emptiness. He twisted blindly, catching the opposite side of the shaft, and hung there, groping with his foot for the ladder rungs, cursing in a harsh, toneless voice. The tentacle struck out again, with swift, exquisite skill. Three times like a red-hot lash across his face, and twice harder across his hands. Then it touched the collar again. McVickers wretched and let go. He fell jarringly down the ladder, managed to break his fall onto the metal floor below, and crouched there, sick and furious and afraid. The hatch cover clanged down over him like the falling hammer of doom. McVickers dropped into a circular room thirty feet across, floored and walled with metal and badly lighted. The roof was of thick glassite plates. Through them very clearly, McVickers could see four European guards watching. They're always there, said the Venusian softly. You'll come to love them, stranger. There were men standing around the ladder foot, thirteen of them with the Venusian. Earthmen, Martians, Venusians, pale, stark naked, smeared with a blue-green stain. Their muscles stood out sharp on their gaunt bodies, their silver collars a mocking note of richness. Deep, deep inside himself, McVickers shivered, his nostrils wrinkled. There was fear in the room. The smell of it, the shudder of it in the air, fear that was familiar and accustomed, lying in uneasy sleep, but ready to awake. There were other men, four or five of them, back in the shadows by the wall bunks. They didn't speak, nor come out. He took a deep breath and said steadily, I'm Chris McVickers, deep space trader out of Terra. They caught me trying to get through the asteroid lines. Their eyes glistened at him, looking from him to something behind them that he couldn't see. They were waiting, and there was something ghoulish in it. 
The Venusian said sharply. Tough luck, McVickers. I'm Loris, late of the Venusian Guard. Introduce yourselves, boys. They did, in jerky, detached voices, their eyes sliding from him to the hidden something. Loris drew a little closer, and one of the Earthmen in the group came toward him. I'm Pendleton, he said. The starfish, remember? McVickers stared at him. The furrows deepened in his craggy face. He said, My God! Very softly, and not as a curse. Pendleton. The man grinned wryly. He was English. The ravaged ghost of the big, ruddy, jovial spaceman McVickers remembered. Quite a change, eh? Well, perhaps we're lucky, McVickers. We shan't have to see the smash. McVickers' head dropped forward. Then you saw it coming, too? Loris made a little bitter laugh that was almost a sob. All the desperate, boyish humour was gone from his face, leaving it old and grim. Who hasn't I've been here, God knows? An eternity, but even before my ship was taken, we knew it. We can't build spaceships as fast as their jovium destroys them. When they break through the asteroid line, Pendleton's quiet voice was grave. Mars is old and tired and torn with famine. Venus is young, but her courage is undisciplined. Her barbarians aren't suited to mechanized warfare. And Earth, he sighed, perhaps if we hadn't fought so much among ourselves. McVickers said harshly, it wouldn't make much difference. When a man has a weapon that causes metal to explode its own atoms, it doesn't make any difference what you stack up against him. He shook his craggy head impatiently. What is this place? What are you doing here? The Jovius just brought me here and dumped me in without a word of explanation. Pendleton shrugged. We too, there's a pit below, full of machinery. We work it, but we're not told why. Of course, we do a lot of guessing. Guessing? The word rose sharp on the thick, hot air. A man burst out of the group and stood swaying with the restless motion of the floor. He was a swart, low-canal Martian. His yellow cat eyes glittered in his hatch face, and his thin, ropey muscles twitched. I'll tell you what this place is, Earthman. It's a hell, and we're caught in it, trapped for the rest of our lives. He turned on Pendleton. It's your fault we were in a neutral port. We might have been safe. But you had to get back. Janu! Pendleton's voice cracked like a whip. The Martian went silent, watching him. There was more than hate in his yellow eyes. Dando, the beginning of the trap madness. McVickers had seen it in men who couldn't stand the confinement of a deep space voyage. The Englishman said quietly, Janu was my glory hall foreman. He rather holds this against me. The Martian snarled and then coughed. The cough became a paroxysm. He stumbled away, grey-faced and twitching, bent almost double. It's the heat, said Loris, and the damp, poor devil. McVickers thought of the air of Mars, cold and dry and pure. The floor rocked under him. Eyes, with the queer waiting shine to them, slid furtively to the hidden thing behind the standing men. The hot, wet air lay on his lungs. He sweated. There was a stir of nausea in him, and the light swirled. He shut his jaw hard. He said, What did Janu mean the rest of our natural lives? They'll let us go when the war's over, if there's anything left to go to. There was a tight little silence, and then, from the shadows against the wall, there came a brittle, whispering laugh. The war! They let us go before that! The group parted. McVickers had a brief glimpse of a huge man crouched in a strange position on the floor. Then he couldn't see anything but the shape that came slowly out into the light. It moved with a stiff, tottering gait, and its naked feet made a dry clicking sound on the metal floor. McVickers' hand closed hard on the ladder behind him. It had been a man, an earthman. His body was still tall, his features still fine, but there was a film over him a pale blue-green sheath that glistened dully. He thrust out an arm with a hand on it like a hand carved in aquamarine. Touch it, he whispered. McVickers touched it. It was quite hard and warm only with the heat of the air. McVickers' grey-green eyes met the sunken, sheathed eyes of the Earthman. His body hurt with the effort to control it. When we can no longer move, the whispering voice said, They'd take us up the shaft and throw us over, into the mud. That's why you're here, because we were one man short. McVickers put his hand back on the ladder rung. 
How long? About three earth months. He looked at the blue-green stain that smeared them all, the color of the mud. His hands sweated on the ladder rung. What is it? Something in the mud. A radioactivity, I think. It seems to turn the carbon in human flesh to a crystalline form. You become a living jewel. It's painless, but it's... He didn't finish. Beads of sweat stood on McVicker's forehead. The men standing watching him smiled a little. There was motion behind them. Loris and Pendleton stiffened, and their eyes met. McVicker said steadily, I don't understand the mud's outside, Loris said with a queer, hurried urgency. You will. It's almost time for the other shift. He broke off. Men scattered suddenly, crouching back in a rough circle, grinning with feral nervousness. The room was suddenly quiet. The crouching man had risen. He stood with his huge corded legs wide apart, swaying with the swaying of the floor. His round head sunk between ridges of muscle, studying the earth man out of pale, flat eyes. Loris put his old bitter boy's face close to Mavicus. His whisper was almost inaudible. Birik, he's boss here. He's mad. Don't fight him. Chapter 2 McVicker's grey-green eyes narrowed. He didn't move. Birik breathed in slow, deep sighs. He was a Venusian, a coal swamper from his size and pallor, and the filthy white hair clubbed in his neck. He shimmered very faintly in the dim light. The first jewel crust was forming across his skin. Knife-sharp and startling across the silence, a round hatch cover in the floor clashed open. Sweat broke cold on McVicker's, Men began to come out of the hole just at the edge of his vision, naked, dirty men with silver collars. They had been talking, cursing, jostling. The first one saw Birik and stopped, and the silence trickled back down the shaft. It was utterly quiet again, except for the harsh straining of lungs against the hot, wet air and the soft sounds of naked men climbing the ladder. The cords ridged on McVicker's jaw. He shifted his balance slightly away from the ladder. He could see the faces thrust forward in the dim light, eager, waiting. Shining eyes, shining teeth, cheekbones shining with sweat. Frightened, suffering men, watching another man fear and suffer, and being glad about it. Birik moved forward slowly. His eyes held a pale glitter like distant ice, and his lips smiled. I prayed, he said softly. I was answered. You, new man, get down on your belly. Loris grinned at Birik, but there was no humor in his eyes. He had drawn a little away from McVicker's. He said carelessly, There's no time for that now, Birik. It's our shift. They'll be burning us if we don't go. Birik repeated, Down on your belly, not looking at Loris. A vein began to throb on McVicker's forehead. He looked slight, almost small against the Venusian's huge bulk. He said quietly, I'm not looking for trouble, then get down. Sorry, said McVickers. Not today. Pendleton's voice cracked out sharply. Let him alone, Birek, you men, down the ladder. They're going for the shockers. McVickers was aware of movement overhead, beyond the glass roof. Men began to drop slowly, reluctantly down the ladder. There was sweat on Pendleton's forehead, and Loris's face was as grey as his eyes. Birek said hoarsely, Down, grovel, then you can go. No, the ladder was beyond Birek. There was no way past him. Loris said in a swift, harsh whisper, Get down, McVickers. For God's sake, get down, and then come on. McVickers shook his head stubbornly. The giant smiled. There was something horribly wrong about that smile. It was the smile of a man in agony when he feels the anaesthetic taking hold. Peaceful and happy. He struck out, startlingly fast for such a big man. McVickers shrank aside. The fist grazed past his head, tearing his ear. He crouched and went in, trying for a fast body blow and a sidestep. He'd forgotten the glimmering sheath. His fist struck Birik on the mark, and it was like striking glass that didn't shatter. The pain shot up his arm, numbing, slowing, sickening. Blood spattered out from his knuckles. Birik's right swept in, across the side of his head. McVickers went down on his right side. Birik put a foot in the small of his back. Down, he said. Grovel? McVickers twisted under the foot, snarling. He brought up his own feet, viciously with all his strength. The pain of impact made him whimper, but Birik staggered back, thrown off balance. There was no sign of hurt in his face. 
He stood there looking down at McVickers. Suddenly, shockingly, he was crying. He made no sound. He didn't move. But the tears ran out of his eyes. A deep, slow shudder shook McVickers. He said softly, There's no pain, is there? Birick didn't speak. The tears glistened over the faint, hard film on his cheeks. McVickers got up slowly. The furrows were deep and harsh in his face, and his lips were white. Loris pulled at him. Somewhere Pendleton's voice was yelling, Hurry! Hurry! Please! The guards were doing something overhead. There was a faint crackling sound, a flicker of sparks in a circle around the top of the wall. Shivering, tingling pain swept through McVickers from the silver collar at his throat. Men began to whisper and curse. Loris clawed at him, shoved him down the ladder, kicked his face to make him hurry. The pain abated. McVickers looked up. The great corded legs of Birick were coming down, the soles of the feet making a faint, hard sound on the rungs. The hatch closed overhead. The voice of the dying Earthman came dry and soft over his shoulder. Here's where you'll work until you die. How do you like it? McVickers turned, scowling. It was hot. The room above was cool by comparison. The air was thick and sluggish with the reek of heated oil and metal. It was a big space, running clear to the curving wall, but the effect was of stifling, cramped confinement. Machinery crammed the place, roaring and hissing and clattering, running in a circuit from huge intake pumps through meaningless, bulking shapes to a forced air outlet with oil pumps between them. The pumps brought mud into a broad sluice, and the blue-green stain of it was everywhere. There were two glassite control boxes high on the walls, each with a black, tentacled Europan. About five feet overhead was a system of metal catwalks giving complete coverage of the floor area. There were Europans on the walks too, eight of them, patrolling steadily. Their sleek, featureless bodies were safe from contact with the mud. They carried heavy plastic tubes in their tentacles, and there were heavy-duty shockers mounted at every intersection. McVickers grinned dourly. Trustful lot. Very. Pendleton nudged him over toward a drive motor attached to some kind of a centrifugal separator. Loris and the blue-sheathed Earthman followed, with Birick coming slowly behind him. McVickers said, What's all this for? Pendleton shook his head. We don't know, but we have an idea that Jovium comes from the mud. Jovium? McVickers' grey-green eyes began to grow hot. The stuff that's winning this war for them. The metal destroyer. We're not sure, of course. Pendleton's infinitely weary eyes turned across the stretch of greasy metal deck to the end of the circuit. But look there! What does that suggest to you? The huge pipe of the forced air ejector ran along the deck there behind a screen of heavy metal mesh. Just above it, enclosed behind three thicknesses of glassite, was a duct leading upward. The duct, from the inordinate size of its supports and its color, was pure lead. Lead. Lead pipe. Lead armor. Radiations that changed living men into half-living diamonds. Nobody knew what Jovium was or where it came from, only it did. But scientists on the three besieged worlds thought it was probably an isotope of some powerful radioactive metal, perhaps uranium, capable of setting up a violent progressive breakdown in metallic atoms. If said McVickers softly. The pipe were lined with plastic. Blue mud. I've traded through these moons, and the only other deposit of that mud is a saucepanful on J-11. This must be their only source. Loris shoved an oil can at him. What difference does it make? he said savagely. McVickers took the can without seeing it. They store it up there then, in the space between the inner wall and the outer. If somebody could get up there and set the stuff off... Pendleton's mouth twisted. Can you see any way? He looked. Guards and shockers, charged ladders and metal screens. No weapons, no place to conceal them anyway. He said doggedly, But if someone could escape and get word back, this contraption is a potential bomb big enough to blow Io out of space. The experts think it only takes a fraction of a gram of the pure stuff to power a disintegrator shell. There was a pulse beating hard under his jaw, and his grey-green eyes were bright. Loris said, Escape! He said it as though it were the most infinitely beautiful word in existence, and as though it burned his mouth. Escape! whispered the man with the shimmering, deadly sheath of aquamarine. 
There is no escape but this. McVickers said into the silence that followed, I'm going to try. One thing or the other, I'm going to try. Pendleton's incredibly tired eyes looked at the livid burns on McVickers' face. It's been tried, and it's no use. Burek moved suddenly out of his queer, dazed stillness. He looked up and made a hoarse sound in his throat. McVickers caught a flicker of motion overhead, but he didn't pay attention to it. He went on, speaking quietly in a flat, level voice. There's a war on. We're all in it. Soldiers, civilians, and kings, the big fellows and the little ones. When I got my master's ticket, they told me a man's duty wasn't done until his ship was cradled or he was dead. My ship's gone, but I haven't died yet. Pendleton's broad, gaunt shoulders drooped. He turned his head away. Loris's face was a death mask, carved from grey bone. He said almost inaudibly, Shut up, damn you! Shut up! The movement was closer overhead, ominously close. The men scattered across the pit had stopped working, watching McVickers with glistening, burning eyes across hot, oil-filmed metal. McVickers said harshly, I know what's wrong with you. You were broken before you came, thinking the smash was coming and it was no use. Pendleton whispered, You don't know the things they do to you. Stiff and dry out of the Earthman's aquamarine mask came the words, You'll learn. There's no hope, McVickers, and the men have all they can bear without pain. If you bring them more suffering, McVickers, they'll kill you. Heat. Oil and reeking metal and white stiff faces filmed with sweat. Eyes shining hot and glittering with fear. Rocking floor and sucking pumps and a clutching nausea in his belly. Beerick, standing straight and still, watching him. Watching. Everybody watching. McVickers put his hand flat on the engine housing beside him. There's more to it than duty, he said softly, and smiled without humour, the vertical lines deep in his cheeks. His gaunt Celtic head had a grim beauty. His voice rang clear across the roar of the machines. I'm Christopher Rory McVickers. I'm the most important thing in the universe, and if I have to give my life, it'll not be without return on the value of it. Janu the Martian away on the other side of the pit, made a shrill, wailing cry. Loris and Pendleton flinched away like dogs afraid of the whip looking upward. McVickers glimpsed a dark, tentacled shape on the catwalk above, just before the shattering electricity coursed through him. He screamed once, and then Birek moved. He struck Loris and Pendleton and the blue-sheathed Earthman out of the way like children. His left leg took McVickers behind the knees in the same instant that his right hand pushed McVickers' face. McVickers fell heavily on his back, screaming at the contact of the metal floor. Then Beerick sprawled over him, shielding his body with the bulk of his own. The awful shocking pain was lessened. Lying there, looking up into Beerick's pale eyes, McVickers made his twitching lips say, Why? Beerick smiled. The current doesn't hurt much any more and I want you for myself, to break. McVickers drew a deep, shuddering breath and smiled back, the lines deep in his lean cheeks. He had no clear memories of that shift. Heat and motion and strangling air, and Janu coughing with a terrible, steady rhythm, his own hands trying to guide the oil can. Toward the end of the time he fainted, and it was Birik who carried him up the ladder. He had no way of knowing how long after that he came to. There was no time in that little hell. The first thing he noticed, with the hair-trigger senses of a man trained to ships, that the motion of the room was different. He sat up straight on the bunk where Birik had laid him. The tidal wave, he said, over a quick stab of fear. What? We ride it out, said Loris bitterly. We always have. McVickers knew the Jovian moons pretty well, Remembering the tremendous tides and winds caused by the gravitational pull of Jupiter, he shuddered. There was no solid earth on Io, nothing but mud, and the extraction plant, from the feel of it, was a hollow bell sunk under it, perfectly free. It had to be free. No mooring cable made could stand the pull of a Jupiter tide. One thing about it, said Pendleton with quiet viciousness, it makes the bloody Jovis seasick. Janu the Martian made a cracked, harsh laugh. So they keep a weak current on us all the time. His hatchet face was drawn. 
his yellow cat eyes lambent in the dim light. The men sprawled on their bunks, not talking much. Beric sat on the end of his, watching McVickers with his pale, still eyes. There was a tightness in the room. It was coming. They were going to break him now, before he hurt them. Break him or kill him. McVickers wiped the sweat from his face and said, I'm thirsty. Pendleton pointed to a thing like a horse trough against the bulkhead. His eyes were tired and very sad. Loris was scowling at his stained and faintly filmed feet. There wasn't much water in the trough. What there was was brackish and greasy. McVickers drank and splashed some on his face and body. He saw that he was already stained with the mud. It wouldn't wash off. The dying Earthman whispered, There is food also. McVickers looked at the basket of spongy synthetic food and shook his head. The floor dipped and swung. There was a frightening, playful violence about it, like the first soft taps of a tiger's paw. Loris looked up at the glass roof with the black shapes beyond. They get the pure air, he said. Our ventilator pipes are only a few inches wide, lest we crawl up through them. Pendleton said rather loudly, The swine breathe through the skin, you know. All their sense organs, sight and hearing. Shut up, snarled Janu. Stop talking for time. The sprawled men on the bunks drew themselves slowly tight, breathing hard and deep in anticipation and Birick rose. McVickers faced them, Birick and the rest. There was no lift in his heart. He was cold and sodden, like a tuted ox watching the pole-axe fall. He said with a bitter, savage quiet, You're a lot of bloody cowards, you, Birick. You're scared of the death creeping over you, and the only way you can forget the fear is to make someone else suffer. It's the same with all of you. You have to trample me down to your own level, break me for the sake of your souls as much as your bodies, he looked at the numbers of them, at Birick's huge impervious bulk, and his great fists. He touched his silver collar, remembering the agony of the shock through it. And I will break. You know that, damn you. He gave back three paces and set his feet. All right, come on, Birick, let's get it over with. The Venusian came toward him across the heaving floor. Loris still looked at his feet and Pendleton's eyes were agonized. McVickers wiped his hands across his buttocks. The palms were filmed and slick with oil from the can he had handled. There was no use to fight. Birick was twice his size, and he couldn't be hurt anyway. The diamond sheath even screened off the worst of the electric current, being a non-conductor. That gave the dying men an advantage. But even if they had spirit enough left by that time to try anything, the hatches were still locked tight by air pressure, and the sheer numbers of their suffering mates would pull them down. Also, the Jovis were as strong as four men, non-conductor, sheathed skin, Beric's shoulders tensing for the first blow, sweat trying to break through the film of oil on his palms, the slippery feel of his hands as he clenched them. Beric's fist lashed out. McVickers dodged under it, looking for an opening, dreading the useless agony of impact. The bell lurched wildly. A guard moved abruptly overhead. The motion caught McVicker's eye. Something screamed sharply in his head. Pendleton's voice saying, They breathe through the skin, all their sense organs. He sensed rather than saw Birick's fist coming. He twisted, enough to take the worst of it on his shoulder. It knocked him halfway across the deck. And then the current came on. It was weak, but it made him jerk and twitch. He scrambled up on the pitching deck and started to speak. Birick was coming again leisurely, smiling. Then quite suddenly the hatch cover clanged open, signaling the change of the shifts. McVickers stood still for a second. Then he laughed, a queer little chuckle, and made a rush for the hatch. Chapter 3 He went down it with Birick's hand brushing past his head. Men yelled and cursed. He trampled on them ruthlessly. The ones lower down fell off the ladder to avoid his feet. There was a clamor up above. Hands grabbed at him. He lashed out, kicking and butting. His rush carried him through and out across the pit, toward the space between the endpoints of the horseshoe circuit. He slowed down then. The guards had noticed the scuffle. But it seemed to be only the shift changing, and McVickers looked like a man going peacefully for oil. Peacefully. The blood thundered in his head. He was cold, and the skin of his back crawled. Men shoved and swore back by the ladder. 
He went on, not too fast, fighting the electric shiver in his brain. Fuel and lubricating oils were brought up, presumably from tanks in a still lower level, by big pressure pumps. All three sets of pumps, intake, outlet and oil, worked off the same compressed air unit. He set the lubricating oil pump going and rattled cans into place. The men of his shift were straggling out from the ladder, twitching from the light current, scared, angry, but uncertain. There was a subtle change in the attitude of the European guards. Their movements were sluggish, faintly uncertain. McVickers grinned viciously. Seasick. They'd be sicker if they didn't get him too soon. The surging pitch of the bell was getting worse. The tide was rising, and the mud was playing with the bell like a child throwing a ball. Nausea began to clutch at McVicker's stomach. The pressure gauge on the pump was rising. He let it rise, praying, his grey-green eyes hot and bright. Going with the motion of the deck, he sprawled over against the intake pumps. He spun the wheel on the pressure control as far as it would go. A light wrench, chained so that it could not be thrown, lay at his feet. He picked it up, his hand jerking and tingling, and began to work at the air pipe coupling. Hands gripped his shoulder suddenly, slewing him around. The yellow eyes of Janu the Martian glared into his. What are you doing here, Earthman? This is my station. Then he saw the pressure gauge. He let out a keening wail, cut short by the crunch of McVicker's fist on his mouth. McVicker's whirled and swung the wrench. The loose coupling gave. Air burst whistling from the pipe, and the rhythm of the pumps began to break. But Janu's cry had done it. Men were pelting toward him, and the guards were closing in overhead. McVickers flung himself bodily on the short hose of the oil pump. Birick, Loris, Pendleton, the dying Earthman, the hard faces behind them. The guards were manning the shockers. Up in the control boxes, black tentacles were flashing across banks of switches. He had to work fast before they cut the pressure. Birick was ahead of the others, very close. McVickers gave him the oil stream full in the face. It blinded him. Then the nearest shocker came on, focused expertly on McVickers. He shut his teeth hard, whimpering through them, and turned the hard-forced stream of oil into the hoarsely shrieking blast from the open pipe. Oil sprayed up in a heavy, blinding fog. Burning, shuddering agony shook McVickers, but he held his hose, his feet braced wide, praying to stand up long enough. The catwalks were hidden in the oily mist. The ventilating blowers caught it, thrusting it across the whole space. McVickers yelled through it, his voice hardly recognisable as human. You out there, all of you, this is your chance. Are you going to take it? Something fell close by with a heavy thrashing thud, something black and tentacled and writhing, covered with a dull film. McVickers laughed, and the laughter was less human than the voice. Cowards! he cried. All right, I'll do it all myself. Somebody yelled, They're dying! Look! There was another heavy thud. The hot strangling fog roiled with hidden motion. McVickers gasped and retched and shuddered helplessly. He was going to drop the hose in a minute. He was going to fall down and scream. If they stepped the power up one more notch, he was going to fall down and die. Only they were dying too, and forgetting about power. It seemed a static eternity to McVickers, but it had all happened in the space of a dozen heartbeats. There were yells and shouts, and a sort of animal tumult in the thick haze. Suddenly Pendleton's voice rang out of it. McVickers, I'm with you, man. You others, listen. He's giving us the break we needed. Don't let him down. And Janu screamed, No, he's killed the guards, but there are more. They'll fry us from the control boxes if we help him. The pressure was dropping in the pipe as the power cut out. There was a last hiss, a spurt of oily spray, then silence. McVickers dropped the hose. Janu's voice went on, sharp and harsh with fear. They'll fry us, I tell you. We'll lie here and jerk and scream until we're crazy. I'm going to die. I know it. But I won't go through that for nothing. I'm going back by the ladder and pray they won't notice me. More sounds, more tumult. Men suddenly torn between hope and abject terror. McVickers said wearily into the fog, If you help me, we can win the war for our worlds. Destroy this bell, start the Jovium working, destroy EO, victory for us. And if you don't, I hope you fry here and in hell afterward. 
They wavered. McVickers could hear their painful breathing, ragged with the emotion in them. Some of them started toward the sound of Pendleton's voice. Janu made an eerie walling sound, like a hurt cat, and went for him. McVickers started to help, but the current froze him to the metal floor. He strained, feeling his nerves, his brain dissolving in a shuddering fire. He knew why the others had broken so soon. The current did things to you inside. He couldn't see what was happening. The heavy mist choked his eyes, his throat, his nostrils. The pitching of the bell was a nightmare thing. Men thrashed and struggled and cursed, so he had killed the guards. So what? There were still the control boxes. If they didn't rush them before the oil settled, they wouldn't have a chance. Why not give up? Let himself dissolve into the blackness he was fighting off. A great pale shape came striding through the mist toward him. Birek. This was it, then. Well, he'd had his moment of fun. His fists came up in a bland, instinctive gesture. Hmm, Birek laughed. The current made him jerk only a little in his thin, diamond sheath. He bunched his shoulders and reached out. McVickers felt himself ripped clear of the floor. In a second he was out of focus of the shocker, and the pain was gone. He came nearest to fainting then, but Birek's huge hand shook him by the hair, and Birek's voice shouted, Tell him, little man! Tell him it's better to die quick now than go mad with fear! Come on! yelled Pendleton. Here's our chance to show we're still men. Hurry up, you sons! McVickers looked at the Venusian's face. The terrible frozen fear was gone from his eyes. He wanted to die now, quickly, fighting for vengeance. The grey pinched face of Loris loomed abruptly out of the fog. It was suddenly young again, and the smile was genuine. He said, let's teach him to mind, Birek. McVickers, I... He shook his head, looking away. You know... I know. Hurry up with it. Pendleton's voice burst out of the fog triumphantly. Jan crouched on the heaving deck, bleeding and whimpering. McVickers yelled, Who's with me? We're going to take the control boxes. Who wants to be a hero? Birek laughed and threw him bodily up onto the catwalk overhead. Most of the men came forward then. The three or four that were left looked at the Martian and followed. Birek helped them up onto the catwalk. They were moving now. It took only a few seconds. McVickers divided them into two groups. You men that are sheathed go first, to help block the charge. It'll be your job to take the Jovis out of the way, quick, before this fog settles enough so they can see to focus on us. They split up, running along the walk that connected with the control boxes, hurdling the bodies of Jovians suffocated in oil. Presently the glassite door loomed before them. Birik and the dying Earthman led McVickers' party. The Venusian wrenched open the door, and McVickers felt his heart stop. There were three Europans instead of one. The guards had come down from above. Get them out here, he said, out into the oil. A wave of shuddering agony tossed through him. The Jovis were using their powerful hand tubes. Only the glassite walls partially protected them. The fog began to whip past him. He groaned, thinking that it was going and then he put his head in his hands and wept with incredulous, thankful joy. The oily mist was being sucked into the box by powerful ventilators. McVickers remembered Loris saying, They get the pure air. Our ventilator tubes are only a few inches wide. He laughed. The bell swooped sickeningly. Somewhere off in the fog he heard screams and shouts, and Pendleton's voice roaring triumph. He thought, We never could have done it if the tide hadn't come and made the Jovi seasick. He laughed again. It tickled him that seasickness should lose a war. Chapter 4 They went in and up the ladders into the sealed storage space next the convict quarters. There was a huge cylinder of lead suspended over the mouth of the duct from the extractor. They must collect the stuff when they bring oil and supplies, said Loris. Well, McVickers, what happens to us now? McVickers looked at them, the lines deep in his face. We all agree, don't we, that there's no hope of escape? If we wait until the next supply ship comes and try to take it, we lose the chance of doing, well, call it our duty if you want to, that is, to wreck their only source of the explosive that's winning the war for them. 
I think you know, he added, what our chances of taking that ship would be, without offensive weapons or any protection against theirs. It would only mean a return to this slavery if they didn't kill us all outright. So his grey-green eyes were sombre, deeply bright. It comes down to this. Shall we turn this bell into a disintegrator bomb, setting the Jovium free to destroy its own and every other metallic atom in the mud? Or shall we gamble our worlds on the slim chance of saving our necks? Loris looked down at the deck and said softly, Why should we worry about our necks, McVickers? You've saved our souls. Agreed, then, all you men? Beric looked them over. The man who refuses will have no neck to save, he said. There was no disagreement. McVickers turned to the leaden cylinder. It was fixed to the duct by a plastic-lined, lead-sheathed collar. There was an arrangement whereby a plug could be driven into the open mouth of the filled cylinder without spilling a grain of the stuff. McVickers reached up and loosed the apparatus that held the cylinder upright. It fell over with a shattering crash. A palely glowing powder puffed out, settling over the adjacent metal. McVickers had one second of terror. An eerie bluish light grew, throwing faces into strong relief. Pendleton praying silently, Loris smiling, the blue-sheathed earthman with closed eyes, his face a mask of peace. The others facing a death they understood and welcomed. All of them, thinking of three little worlds that could go on living their own lives. Birik grinned at him. I'm glad you ran away, he whispered. McVickers grinned back. The End Please leave a like on the video if you enjoyed the story. This is the conclusion of Outpost on Io, a short story by Lee Brackett. For Audiobookie, I'm Ian Hale. Thank you for listening. Come back soon.